All right, are we ready Ready to rock and roll? Yay! All right, I'm uh, Heidi Hobbs. I'm a, a political science professor, and uh, I work with the Office of Global Engagement as a director of faculty engagement. And I work with David Hawley, who is our assistant director of, of community and student outreach, to put on these SDG at three. We've had, and so I'm going to just go over a little bit of um, what what these sessions are, who a little bit about the SDG that we're going to be talking about climate action, uh, introduce our speakers, and then they'll give you an overview uh, of their uh, interest in this topic, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, thank you. All right. So, as I said, um, this is part of our SDG at three discussions. Uh, what we do uh, every month is to try to highlight a, um, a sustainable development goal. And today we're looking at SDG 13, which is climate action. If you don't know anything about the sustainable development goals, there are 17 of them and they address a lot of different topics that are seeking equity and sustainability for people all over the world. Here at NC State, oops, went too far. What we've done is divided them into four bundles. So this past fall, maybe you came or attended a session uh, in our hybrid format. Uh, we did four on the quality of life. This semester, we're doing environmental responsibility and last month we had a session on affordable and clean energy and today we'll do climate action. Next month we'll do life below water and then our final session for this semester will be life on land. Uh, you can, if you're interested, keep going. We'll have uh, these sessions again next fall and next spring as well. Here's the schedule if you wanna make a note of when the sessions are coming up. Uh, about the different ones that will happen. And it's a pretty easy way to find them. It's a go link SDG. So uh, we usually um, feature a faculty member and student engagement. And sometimes we have someone from the community talk about the issue as well. So what is goal 13? Goal 13 is designed to really talk about why we need urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts now. We know it is a real threat and the effects are visible, but it's hard to think about how to engage with that now and get people motivated to move forward. What the SDGs are trying to get people to embrace is an awareness of these issues. And they're looking to identify ways in which people all over the world can commit to uh, the necessary changes to protect the planet. Now, what are the targets? The way all the SDGs, I was getting ready to walk around. The way all the SDGs work is they have targets and indicators. So for climate action, these are the targets. And I won't read them to, to you, but you can just get a sense of the notion of how they're organized. Uh, strengthening resilience, integrating climate change into policies, building knowledge and capacity, implementing the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and promoting mechanisms to do more greater planning and management. Now, how good are we doing on some of those? This gives you, this is a, a graphic that comes from the United Nations that measures how well they have responded globally to some of these issues. Uh, as you can see, we've done, begin to moving towards uh, addressing rising greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, climate financing has uh, increased by some percentage. Uh, 125 of 154 developing countries are formulating and implementing national climate change policies. And then if you can see the smaller area talking about where are some of the highest priority areas. And maybe you've seen videos or, or things in terms of freshwater resources or food security. These are areas, terrestrial and wetlands. You've seen sort of the glaciers melting. So all of those areas are ways, areas that 
the UN is advocating that people embrace the sustainable development goals to take urgent action. And we have a nice little graphic here. This is from the United Nations as well. That gives you a sense of how these issues work together. What are the challenges and what are some of the solutions? The world is warming, what can we do? Uh, how can we deal with storms, floods, hurricanes, and droughts? We've seen a lot of that in this country, here in the United States in the last couple of months. I mean, there's whole towns in Kentucky that are gone from freak storms. My son lives in San Diego, and yesterday they had hail. It's very, his girlfriend sent me a picture, like, what is this? You know, because in San Diego, they don't have hail. So, you know, it just is a climate change, significant climate change that is unexpected. So that gives you an overview of uh, the, the issues. We have two, the panelists with us today. Dr. Roberto Mira is a Associate Climate Change and Society Program Coordinator, and he's also an instructor in the Climate Change and Society Program here at NC State. And then we have Andrew Lauder and Veronica, Ronnie Taylor, who are with the Climate Reality Project, as which is the NC State student organization. So they're gonna talk a little bit about their perspectives on this issue. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Mira, and you can you can see here and see what you're doing, or you, would you like to sit there? Um, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> get up. Might be easier, yeah, come on over. Hi, everybody. So um, today I'm going to kind of talk about how the Climate Change Society program relates to uh, the SDG, especially SDG 13. Um, now, briefly, we are a one-year master's program, which means that if you are finishing your undergrad here and you want to go into the climate change uh, field, uh, just stay for another year and you'll be done. And that's several. Um, Students do that uh, every year from NC State. Um, so really, no matter who you are and what you do, climate change will be a part of your life, um, of whatever career uh, you're in. And um, you know that's why we're here, that's why we do what we do. So instead of showing you a bunch of facts and figures you're probably familiar with, like, bar graphs and time series and uh you know big maps of where the warmest places are i thought we'd go a little bit more personal um, now this here is um, a bridge from beaufort north carolina to moorhead city north carolina i don't know if you guys are familiar with that area but that's on the coast so we know that this location is vulnerable to sea level rise to a hurricane Hurricane Matthew came through there, Hurricane uh, Florence, Hurricane Dorian, uh, and you know several storms a year. Also, uh, winter storms bring lots of flooding and erosion to the area, so it's vulnerable. So let's explore this picture and kind of see what's at stake with climate change. We have the NC Port Authority out in the, in the background, Highway 70, which is managed by the state. So we're talking about things managed by the state. We also have private um, institutions or locations owned by you know private individuals, or, um, and also the railroad, which is uh, both private and part of the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation. Then we have this recreation area. Uh, this is a, a, a part of the town of Beaufort. It's really nice. You can just kind of walk from a little fishing pier under that bridge, and um, it, you know it's, it's really cool. We go every year. I take my my daughter's there, like uh, during our winter break, and we try we take a picture over here to see, uh, you know, see how old they are. Because <laughs> I have twin girls, and um, it's just kind of I I just find it kind of cool that we just go to the same place and and take those pictures. Um, and so this is a, at the end of December, I believe. Um, and also here you'll note that not only do we have the highway, the port authority, the railroad, and my 
the land, uh, but we also have power lines, which have multiple stakeholders, including the federal government. Now, with that said, and, and um, our hosts, they already went through some of these um, points here. Um, Again, you know, we're about climate action. And again, I'm talking like more from a personal perspective. Now, uh, the reason I take all these pictures out there that I'm out there all the time is because besides my work here at NC State, I'm also an oyster farmer. And from the location that we live in, uh, that we have our place in in Beaufort, uh, to our farm, we have one access road, and that is Highway 70. And God forbid there's some sort of storm going through there, that area will flood, that highway will flood, and we cannot access our farm. And also the people on the other side of the of this river, this is the North River, by the way, uh, are stuck. Yeah, oops. Does it remind me? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Um, so as you can see here, the water, is, you can't tell where the road ends and the water begins. And, um, you know, thankfully they had opened the road at that point. I believe the water was receding. And this, I wasn't out there that, that day. My brother took this picture and I thought it was uh, a lot of drama. And I, I told him, let me borrow it for my purposes. Um, so as you can see, you know, it touches, uh, you know, that part of my, my other career as well, climate change does. Um, and before I read through the, the different things here, um, I grew up in New Orleans, and this is a picture of, um, uh, I believe this is like a, 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 from the a fossil fuel companies and a, a power a station also um, near the airport and all of that pollution uh, being emitted into the atmosphere close to a city that uh, suffered so much during Hurricane Katrina, which was partly a man-made disaster because the levees failed. Uh, but again, you know, the oceans uh, are, the sea level is rising and a large part of that is due to uh, these fossil fuel companies that can't be held accountable these days. Um, be because now through attribution science, we are able to kind of tell uh, um, how much CO2 comes exactly from them and how much warming of the planet because of that CO2 is due exactly uh, to them and you know, lots of uh, different uh, arguments and lawsuits can happen uh, due to that. Um, so uh, besides the, the um, SDG target uh, line that um, our host provided earlier, this was like an update that uh, was done after uh, COVID-19. More about the green transition investments to uh, accelerate decarbonization, green jobs, and sustainable inclusive growth, uh, green economy, investable, investing in sustainable solutions, confronting all climate risks, and cooperation. Um, and the reason I'm listing these, even though you know, it was on their website, is because our uh, program addresses uh, these particular issues all the time through projects, through our classes, and through their careers. Once they finish uh, with us, uh, so, so confronting all climate risks, it, like I said earlier, you know everyone is going to experience this in their lifetime. Uh, there's really no going back. Um, I would say history is written and it cannot be unwritten, but then history is relative to whoever writes it down. However, facts are facts, and. Of as much of, of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping emissions we have put in the atmosphere, those things will stay there. And even if we stop right now, every single uh, emission, the temperature will still continue to rise. It's just kind of baked into the system. Uh, 
So the kind of relevant work that we have done in the past um, few years since uh, uh, the program has been active, we have worked on anything from extreme events like extreme rain and sea level rise um, in Nagaset and the, and the waste treatment. So you can imagine how that affects people because it's direct uh, um, um, public health. Um, environmental advisory boards, and this is uh, relative to just just uh, um, stakeholders at a more granular level, like county level, city level, town level. Uh, one of our students uh, worked on that. Tribal resources, web app, greenhouse gas inventories, um, also engaging local farmers in climate action plan. Um, Preparing crops to solar, photovoltaic, take um, ge um, energy generation, and uh, um, NC coastal plain. Uh, that was a pretty cool um, project because the, uh, the student found that um, it was more cost effective for a lot of farmers whose crops weren't quite uh, having as much of a yield anymore to just switch their farm to the uh, solar farm instead. And they could make more money out of that so they could switch up, switch around uh, between those two depending on you know, their, their lot and other details. Um, FEMA hazard mitigation. Uh, also, we talk about uh, communication of disaster risk. And importantly, our students come from basically every single background. We have students coming out of psychology, political science, um, communication, as well as you know the sciences. Your meteorologists, your chemists, your geo uh, geoscientists. Um, so everyone across the board uh, is part of our program, and therefore uh, we have this uh, really interesting projects across different disciplines. And we have our partner institutions that um, we work with every year, uh, but we aren't married to only those. We also uh, work with um, some private institutions uh, occasionally, depending on the person's project. But um, some of these are actually housed here. Uh, as you state, the Climate Adaptation Science Center is here. The C grant is also here. Uh, we see the State Climate Office. Um, we do work a lot with National Park um, Service and local and state governments and um, nonprofits as well. Um, and then with faculty here at NC State as well, uh, like faculty from the Department of Design, uh, Department of Communication, also our Office of Sustainability, uh, the Public Administration Department, um, you know, really across the board, again, every facet of society. And um, it's just a, a few images of um, we, the people at um, the program, we have, uh, um, you know, we're proud of our diversity there. Um, a lot of the, uh, our students have actually you know, done a, a fair bit of advocacy during their time there with climate reality. Um, we uh, work in our classes on uh, resilience planning and also understanding the science. And um, our class, the main classes uh, that I teach are fundamentals of climate change science. And that basically is an uh, um, overall uh, review of what uh, climate change, um, what makes climate change happen uh, from like the, the physics and the, and the chemistry to observations to um, climate models, but all from a conceptual basis. I don't really go into, um, there's no calculations, no math in that. And um, that class is, is free for any, um, it's open to any graduate level, any any graduate uh, students, but it's also open to undergrads. Um, as long as you know they get my permission to be in the class. Also, we have a barriers to climate uh, change literacy class, and that's more of a psychology of communicating climate change uh, to the public. Um, that is also um, available to undergrads uh, with permission, but it, it, it's open to all graduate students. I also teach a class on adaptation to climate change um, in which we really tackle uh, um, the more of the nexus of climate uh, and society. And then finally, uh, a class that's specific for uh, 
uh, working with climate data. Uh, and we go through various different methods of analyzing climate data, which uh, I have, I think, one undergraduate student in that class as well. Um, but it is open to uh, graduate students. Um, that one, I think, has to have my permission, unless you're in the program. Um, and here's our website at the bottom. And you can always reach me. I should have put my email on there, but sorry. Um, but you guys have any questions? If you shy. I guess that means I covered everything perfectly. <laughs> well, let's hear from our student uh, mm -hmm. presenters and then we'll see, have a little bit more discussion. I'm sure some of you are thinking about why you can think about questions that you might have. So why don't you all go right on up? <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, first, I would just like to thank NCSA Global for allowing us the opportunity to speak about our organization and the work that we're doing towards SDG 13 Climate Action. So we are the Climate Reality Project here at NC State. We are a student-led campus organization that is nonprofit, um, a, a part of a nonprofit organization called the Climate Reality Project. And we're really focused on fighting climate change through focusing on hard-hitting solutions through long-term campaigns. Um, and we're also a, a nonpartisan organization. These campaigns push for real actionable environmental solutions to be, to be implemented here on campus so that NC State can be a leader in the climate crisis, like we feel that they can be. Um, also, we try to educate and inform the student body. As one of the only climate-related orgs here on campus, we do this by publishing opinion articles in places like The Technician and local newspaper as well, uh, keeping a social media presence, petitioning in the brickyard, and also holding educational events. Uh, some of those events include things like our yearly panel discussions. Uh, that's the top image from pre-COVID times, hence the lack of masks. Um, but this is where we invite professors, uh, faculty, uh, climate activists in the area to come and speak about the work that they do and have a discussion with students. And we've had really great turnout the past few years from that as well. Um, we also do more pressing things like host press conferences for um, our campaigns. This is the image at the bottom is from our 100% committed campaign. And we do this to garner more support and, and get that, get the word out about the campaigns that we're having um, while also pressuring the university for our asks. Um, lastly, like I said, we're one of the only climate orgs here on campus. and. We really find it as our duty to act as a platform for passionate students here on campus to speak about the things that they're that worry them when it comes to climate change. So we have a very open executive structure and we allow people to come in and, and use us as a, a, a jumping off point for the things that they want to talk about and have their voice, voice heard about. To highlight some of our major achievements so far, like I said, we focused on uh, specific campaigns and our first campaign was our 100% committed campaign. Uh, for that, we pressured the sustainability office to include renewables into the strategic plan. We collected over 7,000 petition signatures in support of that um, campaign. And at the time that was 10% of the student body. We also were able to have direct meetings with Chancellor Woodson and push for renewable electricity and passive gas standards. And that campaign wrapped up with both of those asks being approved by Chancellor Woodson in the fall of 2018. Um, since then, we've been working on our divestment campaign. We will kind of go over more about what that is in the next few slides, but just to highlight what we've done so far, we've collected over 2000 petition signatures um, in support of fossil fuel divestment. We've written over 20 op-eds mentioning divestment. 
uh, in the technician mainly. We've had multiple meetings with the director of investments at NC State to push for divestment, and we keep a relationship there. And we've also written and passed a bill in student senate for fossil fuel divestment. Um, I just want to like say that in my four years at with this club, I really feel like I've gotten to make a difference on campus through this organization, which I've really appreciated. And hopefully these achievements can show that change can happen through student organization. Hi, what's going on? Um, do you guys hear me okay? I don't know, really to these kind of microphones. Um, hello, my name is Andrew. Um, so as uh, Verani mentioned, our sort of um, focus right now um, is on um, compelling NC State to divest from the fossil fuel industry. Now, what that means is, so all um, universities have an endowment. They uh, receive money from um, donors, they receive money from larger organizations, and they can use that money to um, fundraise for the school. They can invest it in uh, certain industries, they can invest it in, in, in certain companies, and in theory, it should be used to give back to the school. Um, so currently, um, NC State has a $2 billion um, endowment that's going to a, a variety of places and a variety of industries. And um, around 3% of that is concentrated in the fossil fuel industry. Um, now, for one, it is um, when an institution of our size gives the amount of money that we are giving to this industry, we are perpetuating um, its actions. Um, we are in a sense um, allowing them to continue um, to produce the emissions that they have been producing. That's a headache. Um, <laughs> now, I, I probably don't need to tell you this, but um, global warming and, and pollution are massively linked to the fossil fuel industry and to improve um, climate change to, to, to rectify this issue, um, it is imperative that um, we weaken the fossil fuel industry and we um, weaken their influence. And it's also, in regards to NC State specifically as an institution, it's important to keep in mind that NC State is supposed to represent the public. The, the science on climate change and the science on how fossil fuels affect the climate, um, NC State is, is contradicting themselves. And, you know, as it happens, they have released sustainability reports. They have uh, released plans on how they will make our campus more green and more environmentally friendly. But they continue to financially support an industry who fundamentally is not environmentally friendly. At the same time, these investments are um, not sustainable. Um, I'm going to get more into this in a moment, but um, universities across the country have divested from fossil fuels, and some of them have listed financial reasons as the main reason for doing so. The entire University of California system divested from fossil fuels, and they described investing in fossil fuels at this point as a gamble. It um, seems to be much more reliable to invest in clean, renewable energy that um, is only going to become a, a larger part of the energy sector. Now, as I mentioned, um, colleges and, and universities across the country have um, divested. It's important to note that we're not in a vacuum, that when one university divest from the fossil fuel industry that can create a snowball effect. Um, so for example, you're seeing a, a, a protest here for Yale and Harvard, um, who at the time had not divested from fossil fuels. They have since then, and um, most Ivy League schools have divested uh, from fossil fuels. 
um, be it Dartmouth, Cornell. Um, so you can see there is that sort of domino effect um, where the, the, the more institutions that divest, the um, weaker the industry becomes. And um, over 100 institutions from 11 different countries across the world have fully divested from fossil fuels. Um, we are part of an ongoing movement that's been uh, um, <laughs> that's been successful um, for about a decade now. We believe that we are acting in accordance with this um, guideline of, of, of climate action by trying to compel our university to um, not continue its support for an industry that is so deeply um, threatening to the climate as it exists today. Um, if you want more information, um, if you want to um, keep in touch with us, if you're interested in joining, um, we have an email that you can um, get in contact with. You can also email uh, myself or Verani. And we have an Instagram. Um, we um, use the Instagram to um, keep people in touch with all the meetings and such. And um, if you want any more information, you can also um, follow the Instagram and DM us. I just wanted to add one more thing um, about the work that we're doing towards SDG 13. Um, because our our organization realizes and it's the backbone of our organization that cl the climate crisis is happening right now and that we must take urgent action like the SDG 13 says. Um, and we realize that climate change is an umbrella upon so many different issues facing our planet that things like homelessness, food insecurity, so many different social and environmental issues can be exacerbated by, the, by climate change and that there are so many impacts for the fossil fuel industry to continue what it's doing. So that's why we also feel like it's important that the university should divest and that the work we're doing is really important towards fighting climate change. Um, also, our, in relation to that, our divestment petition, if you're a student, is in the, the, the link in our Instagram account if you would like to sign that. Just want to put that there as well. Okay, thank you so much. So stay up here at the front and uh, we'll, we'll open it up for questions because we've heard a lot of interesting things here. Uh, I think want to be together. Um, sure, I don't know. So who has questions? Okay, go ahead. And I, do I need to repeat it, David? Do I need to repeat the question? For good measure. Okay, great. Go ahead. Um, so you talked about the state, like you talked about other colleges um, divesting. Why do you find, like, what have you found so far, that, like, for reasons why NC State is not willing to divest as of right now? Okay, it, t talking about NC State's uh, divestment policy or thinking uh -huh. about it. Go ahead. Uh -huh. um, well, um, one thing that we didn't mention in the presentation is that um, not all of our endowment is controlled by us. There is a larger organization called the UNC Management Company, um, and they control the endowments for um, really all of the public universities. At varying degrees, um, most all of the public universities in the state. Um, now, the 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 reason that we have not fully divested is because they okay. right now they have decided and 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 we've talked to the head of investments here, and they've pretty much told us this directly. Right now, the UNC management company is not interested in in fossil fuels, but they believe that that may change at some point. They're they're in, in just what is profitable right now, and um, right now, in their mind, 
our renewable, yeah, our renewable energy is a better investment, but that could change in their minds at some point. So we're trying to get them to commit off of this on, on, on the principle that it's harming the planet rather than short-term economic gain. Also through our meetings, it seems like the UNC management company and NC State as a whole sees it as a, not a political stance, but they don't want to outwardly say that they'll divest from fossil fuels. They might, they might pause investments, but they won't tell anybody. And a part of it also is that they are not transparent about their investments. And that's also a part of our ask um, to be more transparent with the student body and faculty um, to, to make sure that we know that our university stands in alignment with the things, honestly, that they're saying as well to the sustainability office and things like that. Um, yeah, it's mainly just they don't want to outwardly support. They think it's political almost to outwardly support fossil fuel divestment. Yeah. Um, have any other universities or colleges in, in North Carolina have divested from fossil fuels like Chapel Hill or Duke or anything like that? Um, so right now, I believe that UNC Asheville partially divested. But other than that, there really has not been many in the Southeast that have divested, um, including UNC Chapel Hill and, and even Duke um, and stuff like that. Many of the universities that have divested have been Ivy Leagues and kind of universities on the West Coast, but East Coast has been um, a little slower to that. Um, but that's why we think that NC State can be a leader in climate change by, by divesting. So let's go to our virtual participants who have a question. Back online. I have. The computer decided to install updates in the middle of your presentation. <laughs> but I got your slide up. We're good. Okay. Yes, it's up there. They're back online. Um, so there was one question that came in, uh, and this might be true to all of you. So a lot of the SDGs, the other goals, have been derailed significantly due to the pandemic. So like good health and well-being, a lot of the ones we've talked about how has the pandemic impacted this goal? Has it? Um, that was the question. How is the pandemic? Professor Mira, you may have some. Um, well, it's tricky because um, I think at one point we saw that a, lo a lot of, obviously the emissions were down because people weren't out, um, nobody was driving. Um, except for, you know, your Instacart and you know, the delivery people. Um, and uh, the, the price of gas came down significantly. Um, but as with everything else you guys have seen with inflation, um, the price of petroleum has gone up like, like, like a lot. Like now it's going to be like near $100 a barrel. Um, soon. So that's a lot of profit for uh, not just the uh, fossil fuel companies, but also for um, uh, state owned companies like uh, Gazprom out in, in Russia, uh, Saudi Aramco, um, Saudi Arabia, and also um, nation states who have their own, um, their own industry. And um, you know, because of that, it's yeah, it's been it's been completely derailed due to inflation and all these parts. But uh, to, to their point um, about uh, investments in general, um, even private citizens uh, unknowingly have investments into fossil fuel companies. Um, I know I'm able to look at one of my investment accounts and it has, I think, Exxon or something. So, of course, I went, you know, and, and took all that money out and put it elsewhere. Uh, but these are things that are just in the background. People really don't, don't know about. Um, but I think that with, with pressure um, from the public, um, eventually the, the, we will get back on track. Uh, we just got to get over this hump of COVID and people get back to um, more normal lives, you know, whatever that's going to be. 
um, and refocus on, on the environment to a higher degree than we were before, because now we know exactly just how interconnected our society is. Uh, and and um, one, one slide I wish I could have shown is when the pandemic first hit and everyone went indoors, um, all the wildlife came out to <laughs> the cities and dolphins came back to Venice and, and uh, uh, you know, Beijing and, and other uh, cities that are, are heavily polluted, the air cleared out and you can see how beautiful um, these locations were. And this was due to the fact that everybody, you know, stayed indoors and the industry stopped. But it is a, a kind of a window into what happened if we switched all of our um, energy sources to uh, renewable ones, just how much better the world would be. Uh, and it's gonna take some time, but we are going in that direction. Um, anyway, I don't know if that answers the big question, I ramble a little bit necessarily so. Any comments? Um, go ahead. I think just to speak on like the advocacy side, it, everyone, I think Dr. Mara said that everyone was focused on COVID and, and the pandemic, and rightly so, um, but that did kind of shift the focus away from climate change and climate issues, but hopefully that can um, come back into focus once the pandemic dies down. Um, because I know that there was a momentum that even our organization had pre-COVID that we're still kind of building to now. Okay, uh, go ahead. And then we've got one more question, I think online as well. Okay, let's um, begin the you mentioned how COVID like sort of halted the climate uh, focus. Well, I guess my question is, um, what happens if some other significant event happens that sort of halts it again? Like, let's say, like, I mean, I was going to know what's not going to happen. Let's say, the worst happens, like, a, we, America goes to war with Russia or like however that plays out. Um, how is that going to, uh, like, how are you going to, like, we still get it like work towards being, you know, a carbon neutral or like basically like if there's like more can scenario or something like that, like uh, how are you gonna advocate for climate change? Um, well, I know that I, I think it's that we've all kind of learned how to shift um, really quickly from COVID. And even though maybe the momentum changed a little bit. We were still like meeting and having events and, and granted online and virtual, but I think that as a society, we've learned how to quickly shift and change gears. So I am, I'm hopeful that we can do that when it comes to climate change, when it comes to issues like that, because something's always going to be happening um, to kind of shake someone's attention. But I think that we can adapt with that. Did you say there was another question from online? Well, the other, and I think it's been answered, but if you want to add anything to it, it's just a very simple, like, what should I be doing now for climate change? What do you think is a simple but very loaded, loaded question? <laughs> so, like, concrete steps, what are your thoughts? People that should be here today. Are really J join the Climate Reality Project. Everything Take Professor Mira's classes. <laughs> everything you can do. Um, recycling is great, but I would do, I would reuse uh, instead. I would get like, um, you know, not stop using plastic bags, just get like your own bag for stuff. Uh, um, because recycling doesn't always happen. Um, I think it's only something like 8% of things that go into the recycling bin actually do get recycled. The rest gets shipped off to, I think right now it's something like Indonesia where they just burn it. And so recycling, um, is done that way. Um, so, personal level, you know, try to uh, turn off the lights, um, reduce the amount of beef you eat, um, you know, take public transportation, um, get, you know, cleaner vehicles, um, and, um, yeah, it's just, just the basic things, and but it does make a difference uh, every single little bit because that means there is just some carbon that does not go up, and nobody else is going to bring that carbon up if you don't do it yourself. So yeah, it matters. It matters for everyone. I would also say just you know um, 
it, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but to try to, you know, contact your representatives. Um, you know, the, the, or one of the main reasons why there hasn't been significant uh, political action on climate change in this country is because the politicians haven't needed to do it because there hasn't been um, a, a significant demand for it. If, if, if a good fraction of the country was out protesting in the streets about climate change, something would get done. So it, it is important that we, that each and every person that does care about this issue makes their voice heard and, and shows the people that represent them how much they really do care and yeah. Other questions from here in the room? Yes. Um, is there any way we can get access to each of the selections? Yeah, I can, if it's okay with, with sure, sure, yeah. 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 I, I'll, I can send this slide there. So as long as you got signed in, so on your way out, if you did, make sure you get signed in on the paper and we'll, we'll just take that and pull that out. Other questions from the room? So let's ask Dr. Mira one more question. What do you do for oyster farming? Give us a sense of that. How does it work? Um, you know, my uh, it's it's funny because um, my family has a long story, um, a long history of um, being fishermen. Um, like my grandpa was the commodore, and yes, sir. Is it true you can only eat oysters in a month of Nar? In most of the Nar. What do you mean? Oh, no, 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 uh, you're around. Oh, yeah, I can, I, I, if you want some oysters, I can give you some. But is that true <laughs> that you can all, you should only eat? Uh, no, it, you can eat it year round. It just has oh, to be. Okay, it, so that's an old wives yeah, tale. Yeah, that's an old wives it's, tale. It's, dispelled it's, here today. Yeah, uh -oh. they're available. Um, we provide them every month, every week. We, we, um, we sell them to like restaurants and some of the, um, um, more wholesale uh, folks. We sell them to Whole Foods. So if you go to Whole Foods, our stuff uh, will be there. Um, but anyway, so I was saying, so my, so we had uh, folks in my family who did fishing and then uh, they became shrimp farmers because I come from Ecuador and that's where uh, now the shrimp farm went from my grandpa to my uncle and now it's my, my cousins and then we over here for I, I don't know my brother just had a thought it's like hey we're all these oyster businesses that are coming up and people are making money out of it and the three of us my brother my two brothers and I got together and uh, my father put some seed in, some money into um, investment uh, into our work and yeah it's been fun and really like I'm not gonna say it's easy because um, it is very difficult when you're out there putting this stuff together. But basically, you get the seed, you put them in these bags that you know float on the water, um, and you just let the oysters grow. And and um, unlike a lot of other uh, fisheries that damage the environment, um, oysters are great because they clean the water, they sift through all the um, the grossness and the, the things that make it look uh, make make the water just look all tur turbid um, and uh, they they grow uh, uh, using um, um, those minerals and um, algae and and, and uh, other uh, microscopic life forms um, and also the shells are very useful for um, building the the sandbars the sand uh protecting uh the coast now like oyster, um, oyster reefs can be a natural barrier instead of putting up um, big you know walls made out of concrete these things are natural and they've been there for a long time and they will um I wouldn't say stop like a, you know, a storm surge, but it will slow down waves so that by the time the water gets to where you are, it will not be nearly as bad as if you had not had any uh, oyster uh, reefs uh, um, along your shore. Uh, and our stuff comes from, um, the seeds come from uh, a, um, a hatchery. Uh, so we do not take it from, from the water. We do not take uh, from the, the like the wild oysters, we don't take anything from them, uh, uh, and so it's totally clean. 
um, and basically we provide a service by growing oysters and they're delicious and and uh, also they have all kinds of minerals and vitamins that I didn't know uh, that is what um, actually can keep uh, fishermen healthy. <laughs> Okay, great. A little little side tutorial on a recyclable seafood. All right. All right. Oh, one more question. Yes. I ask when does when do you guys like meet? The... Uh, we meet Thursdays um, from five to six. Um, we meet online and we meet in Lamp Drive and I believe room three four one. I think that's right. In room three four one. Yeah. Our next meeting is going to be on climate change and, and migration. So that, that seems interesting. That's tomorrow. Uh, uh, yeah, this semester we've been adopting like a um, like a presentation format. So each um, week there's like a discussion that we hold about a certain climate topic. Okay, a little commercial there. Great. All right. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thanks to our presenters.